right, so I am very excited. I start every single one of these <laughs> broken series messages with that statement, but I can't help but tell you how excited I am. Um, the more I dive into Corinthians, um, the more excited I get as I see just the genius of the Apostle Paul and the genius of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul um, and how this directly applies to our lives. Um, we have been journeying through the letter of 1 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul had written to the church at Corinth as he has brought loving correction with encouragement and challenges interwoven throughout the letter as well. Two weeks ago, we considered the rocks that Christ gives us to build his church, his one united church, one church, which is never to be divided. We also talked about the unique roles that God has given each of us and that the ministry isn't just the job of the pastors, but that we believe in what's called the priesthood of the saints. Or a better way to say it is, we believe every Christian is a missionary called by God to love, lead, and disciple the people around them. Let me say that again, because this is foundational to who we are as Park Center Community Church. This is foundational. Okay, we, th this, this is a hill we die on. This is who we are in our DNA. We are not a church of pew sitters. We're not a church of just feel good on Sundayers. We must be a church of action. We must be a church that really is what Jesus described the church as, in that the church is a group of people that are missionaries called by God to love, to lead, and disciple people around them. The Christians at Corinth had gotten off mission. They had gotten caught up in all the pleasures of the culture around them. They lived in Sin City of the day. This city was known for its pagan temple, boasting over a thousand prostitutes erected to the goddess Aphrodite. It was filled with sex. It was power-driven. It was money-hungry. It was a culture where the successful elite lived as they pursued those three things, money, sex, and power. The church was filled with people living in this culture who had not been so far removed from it. That the competition of their society made its way into the church and the church was divided over which leader they would follow, among other things. Paul had addressed this issue in a few different ways. And two weeks ago, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul issues a stern warning to the church at Corinth where he writes, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and that is what you are. Now, not to, not to repeat everything we went over two weeks ago, but just to serve as a reminder, right? we talked about in this particular passage, right, in, in Koine Greek, there's two different words for the word you. Right? So, so there's the you in the singular, when I say, Mom, how are you? And then there's you in the plural, which is, hey, how are you? Now, in English, we use that same word, Y-O-U. In Greek, it's two different words for when they're addressing plurality versus singular. And every time that we see in the New Testament that you are referred to as a temple or your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, it is in the plural. What he is saying is you, you make the one temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the church. You combined with all the people who have gone on before us for the last 2,000 years, okay? One church. 
There's people sitting in different chairs in all different places throughout the world right now going through this very same experience. They're not a different church. They're an extension of the one church. There is one church. And Paul says, if anyone destroys God's one church, his one temple, God will destroy him. God takes unity very seriously. It is with this in mind that we can see the context of this part of the letter as we now continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So we're going to pick up in verse 18. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. If you have your Bibles with you, if you have any other translation uh, besides what I have, I'm sorry, God's word is still the same. Um, But if you're looking on the screen, it'll be the CSB. That's the Christian Standard Bible. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19, Paul writes, Let no one deceive himself. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Well, Paul cuts straight to the heart of the issue here. He says, let no one deceive themselves. Let no one deceive themselves. When the church at Corinth allowed the ways of Corinth into the church, it created divisions among those who thought they were smarter or wiser. They would separate into classes and follow different leaders who met their personal preferences. By doing this, they missed out on what the other leaders had to offer. Have you noticed that if, if you only hear from, from one pastor, you, you tend to think a lot how they think, and you tend to act a lot how, how they act? That's not healthy for you. God, God, gave you, God gave you two parents, okay, so there's already diversity in how you're being raised, right? And, and it takes a village. It does. It takes a village to raise children. There's a reason for that. They need to experience diversity. There are things I'm great at that my wife is terrible at. There are things my wife is great at that I am terrible at. And there's things we're just both terrible at. That if my kids have to build, whether they're going to be good or not, in that area, based on my wife and I, they're in a lot of danger. But I put them around you great people. Why? To serve as examples, because more, more is caught than taught, right? They, they see how you live. They see how you interact with one another. They see how you interact with the Word of God. They see this. They see how you handle conflict. They see how you handle small talk. They, they experience all these things. And so in, in the same way, in the same way, understand this, it is not healthy if the only leader you are listening to is me. Now look, we're a family, I get it, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be committed to a local church. You, you should be. But, but not, not so much because of the preaching, but because of the family. You, you understand? It, it's, we, we as a family will listen to multiple leaders. We will try to have a variety of, of teaching even here. Why? Why? For your sake. It's for your sake. Now, yes, it's also for the leader's sake, right? As we look to raise up leaders and, and we look to be a multiplying church, we want to be a church that plants more churches as quickly as God will allow us to, right? That's, that's our mission and our vision, yes. But understand something. It is healthy to have that variety, You should be reading, and you should have a variety of books. And I'll tell you what, if there's one book besides the Bible that you agree with everything the author says, then you've left your opinion out. Every book that you read, at some point you should be going, yeah, I disagree with him or her on that. You you, you need to have this healthy, balanced approach as you take in things and consider not anybody except Jesus has arrived on every issue. You got to have that. Don't just, don't just base on one teacher. 
I'm not looking to make many vinnies. I don't want you to be, uh, I, I love that that rhymes. I know, my, my whole life, man, my alliteration is on point. Youth ministry for a long time, right? <laughs> so, um, but the goal is not, is not to, to clone ourselves. The goal is to, to be the best you you can be in who God has called you, wired you, designed you, and empowered you to be. But the church in Corinth, they separated into classes, they followed different leaders, and they missed out on what the other leaders had to offer. They missed out on what other members of the community, who they discounted because of differences, had to offer. Ultimately, by thinking more of themselves than they were, they were only deceiving themselves. They were only cheating themselves. They thought they were smarter, they thought they were better, and so they would not consider what someone who's, who they saw as less than them might have to say, and what that person might have brought to the table might have been the game changer in that person's life. However, while deceiving themselves, their intent is to deceive others. To deceive others about themselves by hiding their flaws. By hiding their flaws or to appear smarter or more important. There's great danger here. And Paul makes it very clear what the consequences are as well. God finds the wise in their craftiness. They get caught in their lies and the truth finds its way to the surface. How great to repent and change rather than be caught in your lies. Paul is calling the entire church to do this. He's calling them to live vulnerable, truthful, honest lives for the glory of God and the unity of the church. Amen. This is so important. It's the unity of the church. So it's not just the people in this room. It's the church. We must be vulnerable. We are all one church. And I know that sounds like a large task. I know that sounds terrifying. But nothing that's worth doing shouldn't scare you. Amen. It should be terrifying. It is a daunting task. But there is freedom. Once you push past the fear, there is freedom in that. It works the way God intended, the way God designed the church to work. But what we do is because we're a bunch of insecure control freaks... Maybe not you, me. I'm an insecure control freak. Maybe one day you guys will, will be as well. So just kind of tuck this in your back pocket if, if God ever convicts you in this area. But he's already convicted me, okay? I am an insecure control freak. And so here's what I'll do sometimes. S sometimes I become conflict averse. Sometimes I'm scared to say no or to hurt somebody's feelings. Do you know Why? Because I'm a control freak. I want to control their perception of me. Sometimes, sometimes when, when, when people make things up about me that aren't true, I have this incredible inward battle that brings me to tears because I could so easily pick up a phone and just bring clarity. But instead, instead sometimes I just need to shut my mouth and allow God to handle it the way he says here, he'll handle it. But I'm a control freak, and I'm insecure, and I don't want people to know all my flaws. Unfortunately for me, one of my flaws I can't hide. I'm a stress eater. Y you can't fake this. It's the truth, and I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm choosing to be vulnerable. I'm choosing to be honest because I want to lead by example. I want to do what Paul did. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, well follow me. Be, be vulnerable. Amen. I can't guarantee you won't get hurt. You probably will. Paul got hurt a lot. But it was the greatest journey. It was the greatest adventure. And at least the people that hurt you, you can see who they really are and what they really stand for. Amen. 
At least there's no mystery. There's no wondering. There's no passive aggressive. There's, there's no confusion. It's very clear. You're for me or you're not for me. You'll hurt my feelings for my good or you'll hurt my feelings for your good. It's gonna be out there, but be vulnerable. And when you get crushed, don't just lay down and die and then say, I'll never be crushed again and put this thick wall around your heart and around yourself. But that's what we do in church world, especially church world on Long Island because everybody in church world on Long Island has been hurt by somebody. The church has failed most people on this island. It has. And I'm sorry, I know that hurts. It's failed me too. I've had my heart broken too. I know the pain. But you don't give up being vulnerable. Because we're one church. As one family who God has called together on one mission. And if we're not going to be vulnerable with each other because we're afraid of getting hurt, do you know what the collateral damage is? Lost people outside. There's three million in Suffolk and Nassau County. Three million people. Less than 3% of them claim to be Bible-believing Christians. We should not be bored. We should not be afraid. So what about you? What about you? What are you hiding? I, I mean, don't, don't you get tired of living a double life? Don't, don't you get tired of feeling like you have to wear a mask around Christians? These are the people you should be able to let your hair down with, if you have any hair. <laughs> you, you need to be able to be real, to be vulnerable. But church, church is the scariest place in the world. I, I forgot who said it, but some famous person said, you know, what's interesting about the church is it's the only place where they kill their wounded. We do. We do. In, in, in the church, second somebody's vulnerable, we judge them and break them down, and then we do what the Pharisees do. God, thank you that I'm not like so-and-so. Really? Really? Here, here's, here's, here's where I hurt your feelings, okay? If what I just said to you got you thinking about somebody else, you're judging and you're out of line. If what I just said to you got you peering into your own soul and saying, God, challenge me, well, then you're paying attention. Don't you want more? The thing you're hiding is only hurting you by staying hidden. This is one of the greatest lies of the enemy. It's called shame. Shame is the most disgusting, vile liar that is out there. Because here's what shame does. Shame tells you you're the only one who is doing what you're doing. You are disgusting and you are not worthy of having that issue repaired. If you come out and tell someone, it changes everything. They will abandon you, they will hate you, they will judge you, and they will cast you out. Three lies that shame says to you, all three are lies. Here is what I have found. And you're talking about someone in 13 years of youth ministry, okay, let's be honest, the average teenager, you know, 12, 13, 14, is dealing with an issue of pornography. And the amount of times, and that, that's one mega shame, and that's one that I would sit down, and once these, these young boys would actually talk to me about it and be open about it, you saw the weight lift off their shoulders. Because shame's a liar. It's a liar. They weren't judged. They weren't beaten down. They were embraced. They were challenged to grow, but then they were given the tools to escape. What shame does is it, it tells you to stay in chains because if people know you're in chains, they're going to judge you for your change. What Jesus says is the truth will set you free. Yeah! Who are we going to believe? Amen. 
And there's something even worse that could happen, which is you keep your secret and you never get caught. And the truth never comes to the surface. Well, that's worse than getting caught. Getting caught is God's grace. It is worse never getting caught. If you never get caught, you only live a life damaging yourself. By not getting caught, you go through the pain over and over and over and the burn of carrying something that you can't carry. There is freedom in confession and repentance. It's okay to not be okay here. It's okay to not be okay here. You aren't judged. You are loved. You are loved by God and accepted as you are. Listen, we're all just a bunch of broken misfits who God has gathered as his own people because of his grace. That is why this is the broken church. Stop hiding. Stop deceiving yourselves. Be free. Be open. Paul continues in verse 20. He writes, And again, the Lord knows that the reasonings of the wise are futile. Futile is a word I love because I am a bit of a nerd, and I love sci-fi movies and TV shows such as Star Trek. And in Star Trek, there was this race of violent robot alien life forms called the Borg. Any Trekkies in the room? All right, yes, cool. So, so you all can see the scene, right, where Patrick Stewart now is, is in the whole Borg uh, outfit, right? And, and now the, they're, they're in danger. The Enterprise is in danger as usual. The Borg board them, and now they're trying to fight back. And he says something that I, I, know, I know all my Trekkie uh, uh, fans could, could quote. He goes, resistance is futile. Resistance is useless. It's not even worth trying because you have no chance at all. Futility. The wisdom of the wise in this world is an exercise of futility. It is worthless. We could have all the science, all this technology. People from 2,000 years ago would if they could peer into our world, would probably be both impressed and confused. Like, what is that thing with three legs doing in the back of the room, and why is there an image of what's going on here on a screen? What are those large, roaring animals that you get into and <laughs> go from place to place? What is happening? And yet, and yet, the means by which you live or die for eternity after this are exactly the same. In all of our searching, in all of our science, in all of our technology, we still cannot change man's basic and most outstanding need of a savior, of salvation. There's no technology that can bring peace to your soul. And we've tried, right? We've tried. This is true not only of our sciences and attempts at explaining our origins apart from God, but this truth also pertains to our hope and our salvation. We fight over politics because deep down we actually think a man in a suit is going to be the one to save us. And so we fight and block each other on Facebook if somebody voted for somebody other than who we voted for. Really? Really? Maybe you've put too much hope in a man or woman. Who lost? Maybe, maybe you put too much stock into a person. If you will divide over friendships, over who somebody voted for. We fight over money 
Because we think with enough financial empowerment, we might be able to save ourselves. We consume drugs, alcohol, sex, power, influence, and anything we can get our hands on to try to save ourselves from the deep feeling of despair and fear that looms. And we try to ignore that feeling. Sometimes we even strive and temporarily overcome it. But every attempt fails, it comes up short. Sometimes we could ignore that feeling for a long period of time only for tragedy to strike and for that feeling to resurface again. You know, after 9-11, every pastor thought there was revival sweeping across the country because the two Sundays following 9-11, there was standing room only in every church in America. It lasted two weeks. Then we realize we don't need him again. Ah, but for a moment, for a moment we realized how powerless we really are. For a brief moment we recognize that the sovereign God is the only answer. Just for a brief moment. Before we went back to doing it our own way. We failed to see that our only means of salvation is by placing our hope, our faith, our trust, our souls, our lives in the hands of Jesus Christ. This doesn't happen through some mystical prayer, but by a true confession of heart and mouth in the way that we now live our lives. It means we change. But let me be really clear. And this is where many Christians get confused and feel they have the right to judge people. Let me be really clear. When Jesus changed you, he did not change you from a bad person to a good person. He changed you from a dead person to a living person. When Jesus changed you, he did not change you from a bad person to a good person. He changed you from a dead person to a living person who will make mistakes. Often, in fact. But live in pursuit of God's best for your life by submitting to the Holy Spirit who takes up residence inside of your very soul. Paul continues in verses 21 through 23. He says, So let no one boast in human leaders. For everything is yours. Wow. Everything is yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, everything is yours. Consider this. This is coming from the same man who said, I have learned to be content when I have had much and when I have had little. Wait a second, Paul, you just said everything is yours. What do you mean when you've had little? You've never had little. Everything is yours, right, Paul? Contradicting yourself here? Everything is yours, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. You know, I find it amazing sometimes what my children will fight with each other over. It's, it's remarkable. Noah will be playing with a particular toy, and despite the thousands of toys in their room, Timothy will suddenly want to play with the one toy Noah is playing with, which is just insane. Aaron and I bought them so many things for them to enjoy because we love them and love to bring them joy. They have access to all of the toys, but for some reason, they become competitive and territorial. This is who the church at Corinth was as well. And if we're honest, this is us as well. We are children fighting over things when we have access to everything God has to offer. He doesn't withhold any good thing. If we're honest and we're self-aware enough to admit it, we will see ourselves here 
as well. But that requires honesty. And what prohibits honesty is fear of being vulnerable because of shame. Do you see how the links in the chain work? The enemy of your souls has had thousands of years to study human psychology. He knows how to hold you down, how to beat you with guilt. In fact, he has a nickname. It's the accuser of the brethren. Well, that's an interesting name. Because he stands there and whispers in your ear, you're not worthy. I know what you did today. I know where your mind wandered. I know if there wasn't a police officer, what you would have done that day. I know if you weren't afraid of the consequences, what you would have done. Your heart is wicked. Your heart is vile. You are not worthy of God's love. How dare you show up at church? You go to church? What's wrong with you? You don't belong there. That's for good people. Isolates you. And then you believe those lies. You believe those things about yourself. You beat yourself up. You torture yourself. And Jesus just has his hand out with a big old scar in it. Saying, all those things are true. But I love you, and I died so that God's wrath for those things would be absorbed. Those things are true, but they're not counting anymore. They're done. They're over. I accept you as you are. I'm not saying you need to wash up before you come be a part of my family. I want you to come in as you are. Listen, let me be really, really clear. The day that we have a dress code at this church is the day I resign. I'm telling the, the the day that anybody, and I don't care, I don't care if they're in a gang, I don't care their sexual orientation, I don't care if they're homeless, I don't care if they're ugly, I don't care who they are. Anybody walks through these doors and feels like they don't belong here because of something I've done is the day I resign. That is failure. We must walk in that same light and understand something. Understand the battle that person had a fight with shame to walk into the doors. To greet them with anything other than killing a fatted calf and a big old ring is sin. Not just wrong, it's sinful, it's vile, it's ugly, and it's arrogant. For us to think we're more worthy to be a part of God's family than anybody else. Talk about lacking self-awareness. Paul warned the church at Corinth to not boast. To not find their confidence in human leaders because everything is theirs. They have access to the same Jesus, to the same Spirit, to the same God the Father, to the same Holy Scriptures to the same promises that God has promised all of his children. We are one church. Jesus died for his one church. He gave his life for the church and he will preserve her. We are the church. And we all share in the same benefits of every member of the church. But understand something. Those benefits, as Paul wrote here, are in Christ. Right? He wasn't contradicting himself. He made it clear that those benefits are in Christ. And it's as we submit to Christ, as we allow him to live his life through us, that we see every benefit that God has for us is available to us in his will and through him as we submit, as we obey. Listen, if you're not crazy, filthy, rich, it doesn't mean you don't have access to the riches 
of God. It means God is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. He's more interested in your character than in your wallet. See, riches are not measured in the earthly way of measuring riches. Paul just talked about that. The wisdom of the world is foolishness. If you want to be wise, then become a fool in the eyes of the world. To the world, it is foolish. It is foolish to find more value in living basically as a homeless person going around from town to town to deliver the gospel. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did. It's exactly what Jesus did. The world considers it foolish. But it is the wisest thing we can do is give our lives to Jesus Christ. Jesus died for his church. He gave his life for his church. He will preserve his church. So we must stop dividing. We must stop hiding. Every lie will be found out. It will be. It's going to happen. So consider something. Do you want to be the one who puts out a vulnerable, true stamp and picture of who you are for one another to see of your own will to be accepted and loved? And yes, sometimes hurt. Or when you least expect it, do you want God to uproot it? See, God is going to make you vulnerable one way or another. And that's not punishment, by the way. Just because you're scared of vulnerability, God's not scared of vulnerability. That's actually grace. It's another form of grace. He is going to make you vulnerable. Do it of your own will. Be humble. Be honest. Be willing to bleed a little bit because in the end it's worth it. Next week we're going to dig deeper into the practical application of what this looks like lived out in our daily lives. But for today, I want you to take the time this morning to search your own heart. I want you to ask yourself the question, what areas of my life Am I hiding from others? Take the time. Really, consider. Now, while, while we're here, right? You don't, have to, you don't have to schedule this. I'm scheduling it for you, okay? It's, it's 1039. I preached less than usual to give you time now to do this. So we're going to do this. We're going to do this right now. So close your eyes. Be alone with God in the room for a moment. And ask yourself the question, what areas of my life am I hiding from others? Ask yourself, what secrets am I trying to hide from God and even from myself? Take the time this morning to be honest and allow God the Holy Spirit to convict you. Allow him to speak. Don't speak for him. Don't speak at him. Give him the opportunity to speak to your soul. Kyle's going to play lightly in the background for a few minutes and give you the opportunity to pray and seek God for healing and for change in these areas. Then we're going to worship, and then Pastor Paul and I will be up here if anyone needs some prayer. So take the time now. Don't take this lightly. Please, don't let this be an exercise in futility. This could be the moment. This could be the day that everything changes. This could be your remember when story. The moment that, you know, you said, I've been, I've been holding this burden for years. I've been holding this for a long time. I've been hiding. I've been afraid of being judged. I've been afraid of being vulnerable. And because of that, I've only been able to go so deep in every one of my relationships. Will break through in your relationship with God right here, right now, and I guarantee you, in no way, shape, or form is he going to give you permission to only be vulnerable with him and not be vulnerable with the rest of the body of Christ. It's not biblical. It's not how he works. 
So be vulnerable, be honest, be self-aware, allow him to speak to your heart, allow him to challenge you. And then we're gonna worship him and thank him in response. Let's pray.